Okay, just sending a note to Jason, um, but hopefully he can hear us as well. In fact, we're, we're basically live. Um, oh, and while we're, while we're here, Stephen, do you mind if we record? Is that okay? Uh, that's okay, but I wouldn't mind having a look before before you sort of share it or it becomes a sort of a an online sort of accessible. Okay. Just, to, just to check in case there's anything there that seems to me that we perhaps might want to edit. Before it goes viral, Stephen. <laughs> that's, that's it. I can see your status changing now, Stephen, in the interface. So I'm pretty sure that you should be able to share now. Uh, this will stop other share screen. So it's, it's changed. So yeah. Okay, so yeah, you, you're good to go. So um, yeah, cool. uh, I'll share now. Might as well start sharing now. Allow. So hopefully you can see that. I think you can see my slide. And we are right at 7.30. So um, just as my preamble to get things started and let people settle. Um, hello, my name is Michael Day. I'm um, National Treasurer of the Electric Vehicle Association. Uh, I'm also chair of uh, AVA New South Wales. And that's in part how this event came about because most of the branches, when we went into lockdown, started to use Zoom to, to connect with our, um, with our members, uh, which gave us a few things. It gave us the ability to connect with people that we hadn't talked to before or couldn't get to the physical meetings. Uh, so we, we talked to a slightly different audience, audience that um, than would turn up physically and people from Newcastle, for example, that uh, couldn't get to into the city or even people that had moved overseas. We've got um, members that are in Italy and Norway. So suddenly we could um, interact with them again. Um, but the other thing that it did for us was let us uh, talk to different people, get presentations from different people, a different uh, quantum of people too, different scale of people like Stephen uh, who coming up. Um, uh, give us a chance for, for those people that wouldn't, couldn't, wouldn't, couldn't come to our events to actually talk to us. Uh, and that started the thought process is if that works for the branches, we might try and uh, go for a bit of a, a broader, grander scale and do something on a national level. And this is our, our first attempt. Um, so if things work, if things work out the, the way that we hope, uh, there'll be more of these uh, and probably more of the things that we do formally will be online and Zoom as well. So uh, keep a lookout for these types of events in the future. Um, launching forward, uh, so I'm going to hand over now to Chris Nash, who's National President, uh, just to give a really quick update on what things that are happening from a national perspective. Uh, and then we'll talk to Stephen Biggins, who's Managing Director of Call With Him and, and our main event for today. So, uh, Chris, over to you. Fantastic. Thanks, Michael. And uh, welcome, everyone, to our first national webinar. Um, this is part of a series of events. This is part of a series of events that uh, we will be running over the course of this year. Um, and we're really looking forward to, uh, to hearing from Stephen in a few minutes. Um, a couple of little updates uh, before we get started. So for everyone who's been um, looking for details on our conference for this year, uh, just a reminder that that's in Adelaide in late October. Um, so you'll be able to see uh, more details coming up uh, about that as they get published over the next, uh, the next few weeks. Um, there'll be a slight change to the conference next year. Uh, we'll also be having, our conference will be moving a bit, bit further forward in the calendar and we'll be looking at a, an April-May conference for next year in Canberra. Uh, and we'll also be supporting the fully charged um, expo that's um, coming up in Sydney uh, next year in October as well. So there are a few of the events coming on. I hope you're really going to enjoy the, uh, the national webinar series. Um, without any further delay, we will get over to uh, Adelaide to speak to uh, Mr. Stephen Biggins, who's the Managing Director of Core Lithium, to tell us about the growing demand for lithium products. Stephen, over to you. Great, thanks, uh, Chris. Appreciate the opportunity to sort of re reconnect with Ava and, and, and the network. Um, what I might do is um, is share my share my screen um, and run through a presentation, then then have a short video at the end of end of that. Um, 
and if you like, I'm not sure if we've got the, the ability to take some questions uh, and have a bit of a discussion at the end. Uh, so I'll just go through the process of um, uh, sharing. coming out now. Great, so hopefully everyone can see a, a presentation. Perfect. Yeah, terrific. So it's a great opportunity to, um, I suppose, to, to sort of download and share some of Core Lithium's experiences, um, you know, over the last five or six years as we've um, been establishing relationships and um, becoming part of and you know developing, developing a role um, in the global lithium and battery and EV supply chain. Um, as a company we were the most advanced new lithium project in Australia. Um, we're aiming to to commence construction of the project later this year and be in production by the end of end of next year. Um, and over the last few years, you know, we've been engaged, um, you know, throughout the, the, the EV and, and lithium battery supply chain um, as it matures. And uh, it's quite exciting and fascinating um, because essentially, you know, the, the, the lithium sector was, a, was an industrial mineral sector, you know, relatively small industrial mineral sector five or six years ago. Uh, and now it's evolving into a, a global uh, commodity of of uh, world significance and you know, critical strategic significance to the globe as well. Um, you know, why are we all here? Uh, it's, it's because of our interest in, in EVs, um, but it's not just us. You know, the, the, the whole of the globe is, um, is really moving towards electrification of, of its, its vehicles. Uh, this graph here, uh, I think is a good, good summary of, of sort of what's happened over the last decade where um, you know, EV sales globally uh, you know, were less than a percent um, you know, only, only sort of five years ago um, and that have been growing really exponentially. And you know, last year really was a breakout year. Um, you know, in some ways driven partly by COVID, I think partly you know, two things there. One is, I suppose, this sort of, you know, um, you know, the, the world becoming aware and, and of you know, <clears throat> what happens when you, you take vehicles and pollution out of big cities around the globe and what that does to air quality. Um, and I think, you know, appreciation that, you know, that the globe's had for that last year um, for, for one of the first times in decades. Uh, and the other one is that, um, you know, with people not traveling and spending their money on traveling, they're treating themselves to, to new cars. And yeah, the proportion of those that are, that are buying new cars are, you know, are increasing that are thinking about EVs, you know, thinking about the future and thinking about, you know, decreasing emissions. So I've seen, I've seen EV growth, you know, um, you grow exponentially in the last, last decade. Um, and in particular, uh, that there's been huge growth in, in sales uh, in Europe in the last uh, 12 to 18 months. And you can see this, uh, this sort of graph on the left here, where you can see some of the Scandinavian, Scandinavian company, countries, sorry, you know, um, where, where, where you know, close to 75% of all EVs are, are, uh, are electric. Um, and you know, there's some really been some strong signals from, from both consumers and from governments about, um, about uh, uh, sort of restricting and closing down the sales of combustion engine cars uh, over the next five to ten years, um, and moving towards uh, you know all all or total of EV EV sales uh, in the future. Um, uh, so you can see you know that scale in Europe. Um, yeah, you know, United States, even though even though probably the highest. So and Europe uh, for the first time in the last few months actually has, has now outsold China in regards to EV sales. So so China was the leader. Up until towards the end of last year, uh, US is still, you know, even with Tesla, um, you know, sort of um, knocking the lights out. Uh, the US is, is only two percent, and I think Australia 
Um, and Chris, you, you, Chris and Michael, you might be closer to the stats. I think it's less than 1%. And it's probably closer than half a percent of all, all, EV sales, all sales of EVs in Australia. Um, uh, what's interesting there also is um, what's happening with uh, all electric car sales. So, you know, in the last year, it was Tesla um, being, being the highest volume of sales. And then uh, China's largest um, EV, EV producer, uh, Volkswagen, Renault, and BYD, another Chinese car producer, uh, in the last year, and then and then in March. So even more recently, we're seeing you know, Tesla as being the world's uh, most, you know, as we're aware, you know, probably the highest branded EV out there, and, and the, you know, topping global sales in EVs. Um, but in China, where where growth of EVs is is high, you can see this little picture here. Uh, of their cheapest sort of budget equivalent of a Chinese Mini, which is which is the the, uh, the highest volume selling uh, EV in, in in China at the moment. So what does that mean to to Australia and to to Core? Um, well, I think it's really that you know that that demand and that growth in, in EVs and the need for batteries to make those EVs move. Um, is being reflected in, in increasing lithium demand. So you need more, more EVs equals more batteries equals more lithium. And that's driving lithium prices up again. So uh, prices had been dropping for the last few years uh, in lithium, surprisingly, even as EV sales have grown. Um, but in the last six months, um, you know, lithium prices have doubled so that the, the raw uh, Lithium mineral pricing in Australia has doubled um, from about 350 US a ton to about $700 US a ton. And the chemical prices, um, you can see here, they bottomed last year, you know, somewhere between six to $7,000 a ton. And I think the latest pricing is somewhere between 13 and $14,000 a ton again. So, you know, the, the, the whole commodity cycle is moving. Um, and it's not just lithium, but you know that's the focus of, of what we're doing and, and sort of what I'll talk about. But it's also having an effect on other um, raw materials prices for, for batteries. So you're seeing that rise in cobalt, manganese, um, and copper as well, and nickel. Uh, so where do we fit in the, um, the global lithium battery supply chain? Um, yeah, it's sort of quite interesting, you know, essentially there's, you know, there's, there's an oligopoly at, at sort of the various levels in the supply chain from, you know, sort of raw supply um, through to chemical manufacturing, through to, through to battery manufacturing and, and then to the, the OEMs, the car manufacturers. Um, those relationships uh, are sort of being, almost being sort of generated and maturing in, in real time. Uh, which is really sort of quite interesting and, and sort of unusual. And I think the car manufacturing industry, particularly the, the large and older car manufacturers, are struggling with the fact that they've had these supply chains that have been set up for you know, over 100 years um, that have been doing the same thing on high volumes and low margins over and over and again, um, are adapting to the fact that they, they need to actually develop, maintain, sponsor um, supply chain relationships. For, for key materials um, for, for them to succeed in you know, having enough raw materials to, to build uh, the EVs that they want to supply, that their customers want them to, 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 to supply, and what their governments will require them to supply. So there's, there's a whole bunch of new relationships that are being set up um, between Australia as you know, representing about half of, uh, of global lithium supply, uh, with Chinese converters who have been doing most of the, the chemical processing in the lithium industry and the, and the battery industry, um, you know, for, for decades, uh, and then the, the the battery manufacturers themselves in China, Korea, and Japan, uh, and then those relationships again between those battery manufacturers and the car manufacturers that are, that are around the globe. Um, and that's, and that, that is changing as well. So the relationships are changing, but also the, the geographical um, emphasis of where the, those supply chains that have been in the past and 
you know, where they're moving to. So you know, that supply chain was very much sort of focused, you know, that, that middle part of the supply chain was focused in China. Um, um, <clears throat> but the, uh, you know, the, the EV manufacturing is, is, is now being done all over the globe. So this slide here is a chart that I've um, picked up from, from the, the guys at Benchmark. Um, really sort of goes to illustrate the level of um, sort of control and influence that China has on sort of the, the, the middle processing parts of the, the lithium battery supply chain. You know, they've only got a relatively small component of, you know, a primary supply. Yeah, and most, you know, ha about half global supply comes from from Australia, about the other half comes from uh, from South America and the remainder from, from China. But in regards to um, you know, China's uh, share of, of production in the midstream chemical refining, in the cathode and, and anode manufacturing for the batteries and, the, and manufacturing of batteries themselves, they control about 80% of production. Um, but what we what we will be seeing in the future, what we're seeing now, is that the the downstream, so the the, ion, the lithium ion battery manufacturing, the having gigafactories that are being established, you know, in the US, uh, in Europe, uh, Korea, Japan. So that's diversifying, and it's and and they are getting built closer to to the the car manufacturers themselves, and then that again is then bringing the cathode and the anode manufacturers closer to 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 those battery manufacturers. So we're starting to see Europe, which really was just car manufacturing, and they, you know, and this they've been slow to move. Um, and other than Tesla, you know, the states have been very slow to move in regards to you know, building their their lithium battery supply chains um, and having the infrastructure in 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 sort of domestically. Um, you know, there's been a strong reliance, if you like, of we'll rely on. Asia to do all that sort of stuff, and we'll just put, we'll just put the cars together at, at our factory. Whereas there's a real recognition that, as I said, you know the car manufacturers have sort of said, well, you know, last hundred years we've been doing the same thing over and over, and and it's all been very predictable. They're now recognising that they need to invest and support um, the development of their supply chains so that they can go re-establishing that system of you know, high volumes low margins, consistent you know, supply on time. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the whole industry is trying to adapt to this in real time as, as the, you know, the, the demand is sort of doubling every three years. Um, yeah, and then the, there's a real um, significant objective. You know, if you look at the volumes of cars that are looking to be EVs that are looking to be built, the batteries that are going to go into those um, global lithium supply needs to increase. Three, you know, please, it's taken it's taken a couple of decades to get to where it is now uh, to to get a number a number of you know, lithium ion producers and lithium mines up to get to a point where the world can supply itself with lithium. Uh, it's take, taken a couple of decades to get to this point. The globe needs to triple that in the next next four years. Right, so it needs to achieve what it did in the last couple of decades in the next four years, and then it's going to and then it's going to do it eight times by 2030 to to supply the world with enough lithium to meet the EV targets of governments, consumers, and car manufacturers over the next decade. So really interesting times. Um, at the moment, you know, as I said, China has has you know historically had you know significant Sort of control and input into sort of the, the you know, mid-tier processing of lithium and battery battery manufacturing. Um, but the, but you know, from an Australian perspective, you know, four producers, so four lithium mines in, in Australia currently represent over 50% of global lithium supply, right? Uh, and core is looking really to be um, you know, the fifth and you know, contribute to be you know, somewhere between five and ten percent of, of global lithium supply. To, so to really be a significant um, significant player. Um, but currently, you know, that the you know the fifty percent of global supply of lithium for EVs around the globe comes from four mines in Australia. So there's there's not much diversity of supply. 
um, and there's a lot of risk of supply. You know, one of those guys falls over, mine collapse, as happens in other commodities, you know, that takes out a big chunk of global supply. And, and it's, you know, it's the global car manufacturing industry that's reclined upon this in the, in, over the next few years. So they're just starting to wake up, if you like, to the fact that they need to be involved in supporting you know, new and consistent and diversified supply of the raw materials they need to, to build EVs in the future. Um, yeah, so, so, but there is new supply coming. Yeah, and core is, is probably, I would suggest, the, the, most, the most advanced new lithium producer to, 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 to get online in Australia. Um, you know, our project adjacent to Darwin in the Northern Territory, it's adjacent to Port, which is great. Um, it's fully approved by government and, um, yeah, and we're putting some final sort of offtake deals and finance deals together at the moment to enable us to, to get into production. But alongside that, there would be um, Minrez's Wadjana mine uh, in the Pilbara in, um, in Northwest Western Australia, Bald Hill, and two other projects in Western Australia that would be looking to, to get into production over the next few years. But even then, you know, they're the, they're the known projects. Um, there's gonna be another round of, of new projects that need to be found and developed you know, over the next five years to meet, meet future supply. So again, um, so you've got these, you've got, a, you've got a scenario of, you know, what was a relatively small industrial mineral sector to lithium, supplying lithium to the, you know, ceramics and glass industry. Uh, there's some of it going to batteries. Um, but over the last five years, the battery industry has grown and there's been, um, there, was a, there was a slight increase in supply of lithium, which brought the price down. And then investors said, okay, well, that's enough. You know, there's enough supply there. We don't need to invest in new supply. Uh, and so there's been now underinvestment over the last two or three years in new supply. And then what happens again is that there's not enough supply, the price goes up and, and there's this sort of um, uh, increase in, in, in demand and, in, and enthusiasm and, and interest and focus in how we get new supply, new lithium supply to the market. So on the basis that there, there, there is new suppliers, you know, um, you know there's, a, there's a balance, if you like, in the, the supply chain that's trying to be established and, and relationships. So, you know, from, from the, the downstream guys, the guys that are buying, you've got the, the OEMs, the car manufacturers that are setting up their relationships with the, with the battery manufacturers. The battery manufacturers are establishing and, you know, jostling these relationships with, with the cathode manufacturers. So they're the, 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 those that produce the cathode, the chemical material that goes into the batteries. And then those cathode manufacturers need to be sure of the chemical and how they get the chemical and, and, the, and the qualify the chemical that, that goes into those batteries. Uh, and then, you know, from our side, from, so let's say, you know, normally from the, from the Australian side, the, the, the suppliers, you know, we're looking to secure, uh, secure buyers and secure offtake so that we have confidence that we can, you know, build our project sell the product and we produce it and get paid for it. So um, you know, Core and, and other, other lithium producers in Australia have developed you know, offtake relationships um, throughout the battery supply chain. Um, you know, it, it, in the last few years, it's mostly been about developing relationships with the physical customers for Australian spodumene. So those are the Chinese converters, you know, 99% of Australian Spodumene, our hard rock lithium goes to China for processing. And so those relationships were typically with the, with the Chinese converters. Um, but as the, um, as, the, as the EV manufacturing industry has broadened and the battery manufacturing industry has broadened um, through, Korea, through China, Korea, Japan, the US and Europe, uh, now those relationships are, are broadening as well. So. Yeah, from, from from our perspective, we're we're you know dealing with our parties from all over the globe and all the way through the the battery supply chain, through as a producer. So we're dealing with traders, converters, cathode manufacturers, battery manufacturers, and and EV car manufacturers that are um, 
really enthusiastic. Really, really, they're enthusiastic because they, they're very concerned about securing supply to produce enough lithium for the lithium batteries, for the EVs to, to meet consumer and government needs and, and their corporate needs going forward. So it's really exciting. It's really quite interesting. Um, you know, it's sort of fascinating um, to sort of be involved in this and sort of see how it's sort of, you know, global industries being sort of um, you know, uh, uh, developing. Uh, and then you've got then you've got governments coming in, <laughs> and so you've got these terrific, you know, conversations at political level, um, you know, um, you know, between China and Australian government going on as you know we're trying to develop these these sort of industrial and commercial relationships to sort of make the whole EV system work. And then you've got the Chinese, uh, you know, then you've got Chinese and Australian government saying this, that, and the other, which is sort of making it difficult to. Um, you know, sort of build, maintain, you know, keep consistency in those relationships. That and it's not just about us and China. It's about you know that needs to work well for you know the rest of the, the global EV supply chain to work well. So where where are we as a as a company? Um, you know, we we think we're, we're Australia's next uh, lithium producer. Um, you know, we've got Australia's most advanced new lithium project just outside of Darwin in the Northern Territory. Um, we've got federal government major project status um, for, for, for our finished lithium project. We're, we're near construction ready. And really our objective is, is to finance and start construction of the project in the second half of this year. Um, and our, our production from the project would currently represent more than 5% of uh, current global lithium supply. So it's not insignificant um, our, our role in contributing to, to a low emission uh, future. Um, and we've got binding in, off taking place with one of China's largest lithium producers already, um, which is sort of linking us uh, to poten potentially be part of uh, a Tesla supply chain, uh, but we're also engaged, as I said before, with, um, with parties all over the globe and throughout the, the EV supply chain. Our, our finished lithium project, um, you know, there's, there's key advantages. Yeah, you know, while we think it's going to be a, you know, a strong contributor to um, global EV and, and lithium battery supply chain, it's, you know, we're developing some of Australia's highest grade lithium resources um, adjacent to, to Darwin City and Darwin Port. So we benefit from a lot of, um, of infrastructure that uh, that exists already around Darwin and Darwin Port. Um, and also, you know, we can produce a high quality lithium concentrate through through simple um, gravity separation. So we don't don't require flotation and chemistry to produce a, a high quality lithium concentrate. Um, and, we, and we've done some uh, some uh, some chemical processing uh, work ourselves, and it's proven just recently that we can we know we can now reach a uh, what's called a, a battery grade lithium hydroxide product. So you know, it has all the right. Um, specifications, if you like, for, uh, for meeting uh, battery specs. Uh, the project itself, uh, we're located uh, adjacent to Darwin City and Darwin Port, where, um, you know, where, where you'd like to call it good planning, but sometimes the, um, you know, the rocks are just in, in the right place. Um, you're only 25 kilometres away from Darwin CBD, um, less than an hour's drive from Darwin International Airport. Um, um, and importantly, you know, we've got really good road connection uh, to Darwin Port, which is, you know, Australia's closest export port to, to markets uh, in Asia and in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, uh, and there's a lot, and, you know, only 45 minutes drive from the suburbs of Darwin. So, you know, really, the, you know, there's, there's a lot of benefits of having the project there, um, being able to house our, our workforce residentially in Darwin, you know, it's actually probably a lot better for you know, so the well-being of our workforce as well, as opposed to you know fly in, fly out, and into sort of remote parts of um, the desert in Western Australia to to work. Um, so yeah, we've got a project that's strong. Uh, it's got good, strong bones. Um, you know, those those parties, you know, both local and overseas that come to the project recognise its strengths and its you know the benefits of the of that infrastructure. Um, and we're well placed as a company now. We've you know been investing in the project for um, you know for over five years, and and we're now you know sitting on this uh, you know very good project at the right time as um, lithium demand and lithium prices uh, uh, increase. Uh, 
what uh, what uh, certainly sort of sparked a lot of interest in the in the company um, over the last six months is is our our largest shareholder and our and our, um, our binding off taker um, signing up to supply Tesla with uh, fifty thousand tons of lithium hydroxide per year. So, you know. Indirectly, it's very likely we we um, we're likely to become part of Tesla. Core will become part of uh, Tesla's supply chain. You know, very simply, we we would be supplying Yahua with uh, with about seventy five thousand tons per annum of uh, high quality lithium concentrate. They'll be converting that to lithium hydroxide, and uh, and then they'll be selling lithium hydroxide to to Tesla. Um, so that's really quite interesting. Um, there's uh, if you look at this sort of slide again, there's this sort of complex set of relationships that are sort of being developed between the the, the you know the battery manufacturers on the left and the car manufacturers in the middle, um, uh, as they all sort of look to sort of um, jostle, compete, um, you know, develop technologies, develop new cars, improve battery technologies, and so that's a really you know that's a really big thing. Um, about sort of improving battery technologies, efficiencies, energy density is a really big driver there. Uh, and battery chemistries are changing with that as well. So, you know, where lithium comes from and, you know, the chemistry of the, the lithium that's provided to the batteries is changing as well. And, and the, you know, the, the types of metals goes into those batteries is constantly evolving. Um, yeah, and there's a you know, level, level of competition in, in those new battery designs, how they're manufactured, and the relationships between those, you know, the, those structure of those batteries and their efficiencies with the with the EV manufacturers as well. Um, yeah, so that's a quite sort of, you know, and that's sort of dynamic. It's um, yeah, it's adjusting. It's happening in real time as this substantial growth of the industry is, is sort of continuing on, and um, and that's not going to that's not going to slow down. That's not going to plateau. Uh, uh, yeah, and as I said, the um, the lithium supply chain needs to triple in the next four years, and it needs to increase eight times by 2030. Um, so there's exciting times ahead of us, and there's going to be yeah a lot of coordination globally, really. And I think that's the thing. There's going to be a lot of coordination between uh, Australia, the rest of the world, um, you know, China to achieve um, uh, those goals of supplying the world with, with EVs in a meaningful way uh, in, in decades to come. So that, that's sort of like a, um, yeah, sort of a summary of, sort of our experiences and, and what we're sort of seeing in the marketplace at the moment and um, you know, sort of the relationships that we've seen um, <clears throat> From yeah, you know, that's from an Australian upstream suppliers perspective. I'm sure you know other other parts of the supply chain and would have slightly different views. And um, but yeah, you know, that that's that's a sort of a you know representation, if you like, of, of how we've seen um, and experienced the um, um, you know, how Australia is involved in uh, being part, you know a significant contributor to the lithium battery and, and EV supply chain. And uh, from from our company's perspective. You know, we're really looking forward over the next 12 months to becoming an active uh, participant and contributor to um, to the, the growth in Vs and, the, and a, a lower emission future. So thank you. Thanks, uh, Chris. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Stephen. Um, there are a few questions that are coming up in the chat and in the Q&A panel, so, um, sure. which I'll read out. Um, but if anyone else has got questions, make sure you, you put them into the chat and in the, in, or into the Q&A panel. Um, so Charlie asks, uh, is there enough lithium in the world for full, the full transition to electric vehicles? Yeah, so you know, there's enough there's enough lithium, you know, in the you know the Earth's crust, if you like, like iron ore and aluminium and copper, to 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 meet our needs in the future. Um, but it's really about um, finding it in the right place and in the right form where it can be extracted um, efficiently and, and economically and in a, you know with a reasonable yeah, and in, a, in an environmentally sound way. So, yes, yes, you know, if you did the math, the, the, you know, there's enough lithium in the, in the Earth's crust to supply the, you know, the car industry for you know, the next thousands of years. 
but it's really about being in, a, being in the form, in a concentration where it can be uh, extracted efficiently and sustainably is the, is the, you know, that's the hard part. Sort of a, a similar question. Dave's asking, is there a notion of peak lithium? I, I guess that we're a little ways off of that, but is that likely to be a thing? Um, we'll run out of lithium at, at, in the future. Well, I think the industry is really in its, um, its early stages. Uh, as I said, you know, there's four mines representing um, you know, half the world's supply. So, so I think we're a long way away from that point. Mm. Yeah. Um, and is Australia looking at going up the, up the uh, scale, uh, pushing into processing, um, not yeah. just digging? Yeah, yeah, it is. And I, I think that's a, it's a, a, it's a good thing. I mean, we don't have a car manufacturing industry, so there's, there, there is a, a limitation there. Um, but yes, I think, I think Australia is, and Australia should be looking at um, being involved in further value add. Um, the, the challenge is the access to capital to be able to do that. Um, uh, and that's, that's, that is sort of, that's the sort of the tough step, if you like, and you know, it would certainly be, uh, you know, I think there should be, I think, I think the, the feds are actually starting to get on board with that, is a sort of recognition that, look, if it domestically, we want to be um, yeah, in, in, man, in chemical manufacturing and in manufacturing, we've got to actually invest and we've got to support that industry. Um, so the feds are actually getting on board. They've got a, what's called, I think, the modern manufacturing strategy, which is about looking to support manufacturing locally. Um, so I certainly think that, that, um, that Australian producers will go from mining into producing lithium chemical. And actually that's sort of something that CORE is putting some, some thought into as well, which is, you know, once we're in production of producing uh, uh, the lithium concentrate, is um, you know, leveraging that, that asset and that production to, and also leveraging the industrial infrastructure at, at Darwin Port to look at chemical manufacturing, lithium chemical kind manufacturing of, in the future. Kind of makes sense. And we're never very good at that, it would seem, to, to go up the, um, that next step along the line. But anyway, um, a question yeah, from well, Fraser yeah, is saying, yep. sorry, you go, you go. No, again, it, it's, about, it's about Australian companies getting mm. access to, to domestic capital so the funding, the finance, the dollars to actually make that. Commitment. Make it so. Yep. Yeah, make it so. Um, so uh, Fraser's asking is, is, uh, is the, your processing, your business, your um, mine, um, a high energy requirement? Um, can it be run off renewables or does it, um, is it going to come off the grid? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. We, we, we're looking to plug into the grid and to be able to access renewable, so renewable generated energy uh, through power through through the through the grid. So that's terrific. So that's one of the advantages of being sort of close to to infrastructure is, is to be able to do that. Um, and we're we're also doing some sort of studies at the moment um, on to try and look put some metrics around our sort of you know sort of carbon footprint of the project. Um, but I would suggest there are, there are a bunch of um, sort of efficiencies around the project that, that, that um, might put us in the position of being you know, one, one, if not the, the, the lowest carbon uh, footprint lithium project in Australia. So uh, I think a bit of a, a cheeky question from, from Dickie saying that, that uh, you could see that the uh, price of lithium is doubling, but uh, core lithium's price is, is actually stable or going down. So, um, just <laughs> what your thoughts were on that? Uh, I think uh, it's. Uh, I suppose there's a lot of enthusiasm with uh, with sort of stock markets, and they sort of trade up and they trade down. You know, um, um, from our perspective, you know, the lithium price is is higher. Uh, now than it was, you know, a uh, couple of months ago when our share price was higher. Uh, sorry, the, the lithium price is higher now than than than, than when our share price was a couple of um, a couple of months ago. So, you know, share prices go up and down, but I would but I would say that um, you know we core is in a really good place to develop our project. We're engaged with uh, parties all over the globe and throughout the the supply chain that are looking to give us support to get into production. Um, so I, and I, 
I had a sort of similar question in that, in that and, uh, I was talking to a friend the other day um, and we were surmising that it's too late to get into lithium, it's too late to invest in lithium, but I'm guessing from the numbers that you're talking about here, that's not the case. It's it's still early days. Yeah, I, I, I think so. There's, you know, well, I'm not going to you know, give investment advice on, on, on this presentation, but everyone's going to do their own, their own research. But um, you know, all I can say is that as a company, we're really well placed to participate and become a a lithium producer next year, um, and you know that we're going to get there's a, there's a lot of love in the room, if you like, for from the the lithium battery supply chain to 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 enable new supply to to get into production. So, um, Andreas' question is, uh, what keeps you up at night? Uh, where do you think the big risks lay in getting to market? Yeah, um, I, I, I'm probably a little bit more relaxed than um, that I was. I was probably, you know, a couple. Of, if you'd asked me last year, it would be, you know, when the heck is the lithium price going to go up, yeah. and you know, reflect what we're seeing as dynamics in the in the fundamental dynamics in the industry, um, and that's changed. So um, that's probably about the performance of the crows, I think, as a footy team. That's what keeps yeah. me up. Uh, <laughs> uh, and there's another question from Phil, and you sort of touched on it before, is that the offtake at the moment is, is mostly Chinese-based and the political climate is not helping there. Is that something that's a concern? Well, and do you think that the business, the business and the industry is big enough to get around that or work through that? Yeah, I, I, we're, we're sort of mindful of it and, and concerned. Um, and so, you know, we, we, you know there's, there's probably more effort from both sides to, to um, sort of Stay, stay uh, in communication and, and sort of keep that sort of understanding going between sort of what we're trying to achieve. I, I genuinely think, like iron ore, that, um, that the industry and the business is too important to both sides to compromise. Um, so that's, that's, that's my view. Uh, there are another couple of issues that are uh, is, uh, questions that I might just jump over. Um, they talk to diversity in your business, but that's I think that's a bit off list, so we will jump over those. Um, and, and there were some questions about uh, um, your expected output, but I think you answered those in that you'll be what five percent of the global market and um, out of the gate. So I think that you, you've answered that question already. Um, anyway, here we go. Uh, can you speak uh, a little bit more about the environmental costs? This is from, from Michael, uh, uh, Michael Bond. A bit more about the environmental costs of the project um, compared with other extraction methods. Mm. Yeah, well, I suppose we're, we're sort of mindful of that. So, you know, as I said, we're, we're putting some metrics to sort of carbon footprint. And I, and I think we'd, we'd like to be able to put some metrics to, to, to why we think we are going to be one of the, the lowest sort of you know, carbon footprint projects. In Australia, I suppose that's um, um, it's, it's one of those things, isn't it? Because you're in that business to feed uh, a business, a an industry that, that touts itself on being uh, uh, carbon efficient. So it's part of what you have to do to, to yeah. as your business to answer and respond to that. Yeah, that's right. Um, so certainly, one of the other things that we're looking at uh, at the moment quite seriously is about um, you know, electrifying our mining fleet um, going forward as well. Um, it may not happen, you know, from day one, but I think um, we're certainly looking at sort of opportunities, if you like, to, to electrify the mining fleet. So again, that goes to sort of reducing emissions and increasing efficiencies. Um, uh, so, and is it, and, uh, is it yeah. like I imagine that um, you know, big mining is that it, you move the earth crust aside, you scoop it out, you put it in a truck, and you, you load it into a big ship? That's that kind of. It is that kind of process. Yeah, correct. You know, relatively simply, it's um, it's mining uh, lithium-rich granite. Um, it's called pegmatite, but you know, any geologist would tell the difference between a, a pegmatite and a granite. Um, so essentially, it's a, it's a lithium-rich version of um, you know what your sort of kitchen bench top is made out of, um, uh, and we we crush it, we separate it using gravity and water, uh, and then and then um, and then ship. Yeah, in the first stage of the project, we would then export that to markets overseas. Um, you know, potentially in the in the longer term, where we're looking at looking to sort of process that locally. Um, and yeah, then that that probably also looks at sort of 
you know, less, less, um, less material movements, and again, you know, efficiencies on sort of transports and emissions. So and it is, it's a uh, open cut, isn't it? It's not an underground mine. Yeah, initially it starts as an open open uh, cut, and then as it uh, goes deeper, it goes to underground. Oh, right, okay. So you've got both. Um, there's a question here from um, uh, who are CORE's uh, biggest competitors? Are they local or are they um, OS-based? Yeah, so well, I suppose there, there, there aren't that many competitors. Um, yeah, mm. the existing producers, um, you know, so there's, there's four of those. Uh, there's a couple of other projects in Australia that are looking to to uh, sort of get into production over the next few years, but really core is the most advanced of of those new projects. And they um, seem to be the, the I mean, I saw there's uh, Westfield in there, West Farmers, I should say. Um, uh, but the, we're not talking the big BHPs or the, what you'd class as, in my mind, being very simplistically who the miners are. It seems to be the specialty miners that, that are in, in the business. That has been to date, although in the last, um, about six months ago, a big diversified uh, uh, nickel and, and gold miner uh, independence group um, bought a 25% uh, interest in the Green Bushes lithium mine in Western Australia from mm. the Chinese group Tianchi that was going through some sort of financial um, challenges. So, you know, they're, they're probably one of the first big diversified miners to, to sort of move into the, um, to the area the lithium space. Yeah. Uh, Rio, so Rio Tinto have an interest in um, in a project in in um, in Eastern Europe, um, but they're sort of struggling with sort of social license for that. I think Jadar is the name of the project. Yeah, very big project. So that was sort of their play, if you like, into into lithium. Um, and BHP currently when they're talking about sort of battery materials and, and minerals, they're, they're talking about copper as being, you know, that's, that's their thing for how they're contributing to, to sort of, you know, lower emissions, sort of critical, critical and battery minerals. And is that why, the, the, I mean, it's, I mean, like I say in my head, I see a miner as one of the big ones, but is that because of the, the scale of, of digging copper or digging iron ore or digging coal for that matter, uh, as opposed to the scale of what we've got in lithium right now? They're just different quantums, um, just because yeah. of the history. Yeah, correct, correct. You know, that, that, they are very big companies and, you know, the scale of the industry is is in some ways not material to, to the scale of business that they would typically do in, in iron ore, copper, coal, right. you know, that sort of thing. So, a um, uh, question from, from Chris, uh, Chris Nash, actually. Uh, do you see the home battery as a potential market in the future, home batteries? Yeah, yeah. So, um, very definitely. So, so you know, most of what I was talking about there was about um, sort of, you know, bat lithium batteries for, for, for EVs, um, given, you know, sort of um, the emphasis of uh, EVA. But, but yes, the... the growth in lithium batteries for, for you know, home, home energy storage uh, and for batteries for anything, yeah, you know, uh, is growing exponentially. Um, so, you know, certainly um, energy storage, power storage for stationary storage is also going to be a big consumer of uh, lithium in the future. And a kind of question from me, I mean, uh, again, a conversation I was having with a, with a friend and they were talking about all sorts of new batteries, salt batteries, or, or there are a few other things that came up. And I, I was saying, well, all well and good, but lithium's the future for a significant period of time. And I, I guess because of the, what, what you're doing and what you're investing in, you, you double down on that and say, that's the case, that lithium's going to be with us for a long time and an important part of EVs and storage for a long time? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so so there's probably a couple of things that, that I can talk to there is that sort of, um, yeah, sort of like the, the next technology, if you like, for lithium batteries that's been talked about to sort of evolve over the next decade is is solid state lithium batteries, so lithium metal batteries. Oh, okay, so, so the solid state still use it, lithium. Yeah, so it's, so it's really about sort of, you know, uh, and, and that even, that, that uses even more lithium sort of per, per, per battery. Okay. Right. All right. So that's where sort of the next technology is likely to go over, over the next battery technology over the next decade. But, but what underlying that really is where lithium sits on the, um, the periodic table. Um, you know, it's number three on the periodic table. It's, it's the most sort of energy, energy dense, um, you know, solid, solid metal that, that exists. 
So it's physics. It's Correct. I get it. Thank you. Uh, so that's kind of the list of, of the questions. Um, I think we're done. Thank you very much, Stephen. Yeah, great. No, I appreciate the opportunity um, and you know, some really good questions in there. Um, we look forward to um, uh, participating and being involved in the National Conference in, in Adelaide uh, later in the year. Well, good. Thank you very much. Um, good. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, just to, to finish out, um, for our New South Wales members, uh, just sort of pointing ahead that um, in 9th of June, well, we've got our general meeting at Borkham Hill Sporting Club and on the 23rd of June, we're going over to the Audi Centre to have a look at their e-tron. Uh, more information coming from that soon. Um, apart from that, uh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Chris. Uh, very informative. It was one of those things I thought that was going to be an important discussion because, you know, being EV aficionados, one of the things that comes up is, well, you know, where does the lithium come from? What is, what is this lithium thing? Um, what's the impact on us and others? So very helpful and very informative. Thank you very much. Um, so with that, uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, good night. Hope to see you again in the future on um, more of our events, hopefully more of our virtual events. Uh, good night.